Well, that's a tough question. And um, one of the reasons it's tough is that um, the biggest misconceptions are often only visible in hindsight. But I think it's a pretty safe bet that the tendency to anthropo anthropomorphize AI to think that it's going to be like us, only somehow sort of more so, uh, I think that's likely to be a big misconception. Uh, I think it's much more likely it'll be very unlike us and that will make it much harder to understand um, because we won't be able to get to an understanding by extension from our understanding of ourselves. Well, I was tempted to cheat here and say that your next question, the one about who should be in charge and involved mm. in developing ethical frameworks is the most important question. Um, but if I'm not allowed that answer, then I, 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 I'd offer two, I think. One is the, um, the, um, the control problem, a, um, the issue of AI safety in the long run. Um, but I think perhaps um, in the shorter term, at least to some extent shorter, um, the issue of um, machine consciousness is one that we should be very concerned about because we need to be very sure that we're not building mechanical slaves or, or machines capable of suffering. I do think that it needs to be inclusive in several directions. Uh, for example, the process needs to involve end users in some way, especially disadvantaged end users or, or representatives for them. And it needs to be very well connected in a global sense because wherever they're developed, these are going to be technologies which will have global impacts. Um, and the responsibility of ensuring that they're used well, uh, therefore falls on everybody's shoulders and the effort of and making sure it's beneficial it needs to be, among other things, a globally collaborative one. But briefly, I think that academia has several distinctive features that give it a key role to play. Uh, for example, some degree of independence from government and uh, technology firms access to a very broad range of um, disciplinary viewpoints uh, and the, the um, infrastructure for creating global communities of experts, for example, all of those are going to be important things. Well, this is a kind of question that's especially difficult to answer, except in hindsight. Um, and the biggest changes uh, to us coming from AI are almost certainly um, still in the future, probably quite a long way in the future. Um, some people seem to expect some kind of sudden step change, um, either for better or worse. And on the pessimistic side, for example, um, Yuval Harari has talked about the dangers of what he calls in this so acute equation B plus C plus D equals HH. So biology and brain science plus computing plus data equals human hacking, the ability to change ourselves uh, in radical and uh, possibly dangerous ways. I'm somewhere in the middle between op optimism and pessimism on this. And, and on the particular point of human hacking, I think that we've been hacking ourselves for a long time. Um, think of education, for example, or various social systems. Um, or going further back, think of the development of language. Um, so um, I, I think uh, Harari is right that we're going to change ourselves pretty dramatically. Um, but uh, I think that's inevitable and I don't think it's necessarily a cause for pessimism. It is a cause for caution. I think he's absolutely right about that. Well, as some of my Cambridge colleagues have pointed out in a, an excellent recent piece, one of the difficulties of the present situation is that we're having to make these ethical choices on the run. Um, but there are some obvious approaches for mitigating potential harms. For example, we can build sunset clauses into emergency legislation. Uh, we can ensure that proper review happens afterwards to learn the lessons for future cases. Uh, and 
I think it's particularly important we can take extra steps to earn trust, for example, by establishing penalties for misuse of data beyond the needs of uh, contact tracing. 